Uh, dear participants and guests of the forum, dear colleagues, may I welcome all the participants of the forum and express my gratitude to all the organizers of the forum. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak at the International Legal Forum uh, 2014, which uh, initiated uh, this session uh, at the initiative of the head of the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service of the Russian Federation, Mr. Igor Artemiev. We got together here in order to exchange experience and look for jointly joint solutions uh, in protecting competition within the inter governmental associations uh, we will be able to assess the progress made uh, analyze the current situation and uh, plan for the future. The Republic of Armenia is on the threshold of a qualitatively new stage of integration. A new integration is structure, uh, the single economic space alongside with the Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan formed customs union will become an important stage in economic integration of the Republic of Armenia into a, a higher status and extended association, Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, today, our countries face the challenge of coordinating social and economic uh, revamp and achieving such long-term goals uh, is an important uh, task indeed. Creating favorable conditions for competition will contribute to the development of the economy of our countries and promote entrepreneurship and protect the interests of the consumers. Notably, uh, an important role is to play, uh, to be played by forming the single legal space on the territory or the customs union signatories that will help to protect uh, the states uh, from unfair trans uh, uh, cross-border practices. Our anti-monopoly authority has already reviewed um, uh, the proposal uh, for the single um, competition and uh, trade uh, principles so that have been s signed uh, as guidelines by the Customs Commission. At this forum, I would like to address a number of issues that relate to the e in existing system of parallel implant in the import in the sphere of m medical substances and the prospects for their development and use in the Eurasian Economic Union. In many countries, uh, uh, parallel import, the free import of products is allowed. Parallel import, import helps limit imperialistic activity on commodity markets and uh, prevent division of the market between producers and uh, their suppliers. That uh, in, uh, helps to decrease the, uh, the prices and uh, ensure the free trade turnover. In the, uh, the parallel import system, together with all these its advantages, uh, has to provide for the regulatory mechanism in order to drive out unfair competition practices. Currently, in the Republic of Armenia, uh, so parallel uh, import is uh, found in the pharmaceutical business. Uh, we have invested, uh, we have uh, formed and implemented legal mechanisms uh, providing for parallel import of medication. It provides for import of the medication not from the direct m manufacturer, 
However, it, uh, the change in the packaging should not jeopardize the effectiveness, quality and safety of the product. In order uh, to provide for the economic entities to be able to import, to, to use the parallel import scheme, it is important to that the uh, authorized uh, entities uh, provide for the compliance certificate uh, by the importers uh, of the third countries. Uh, in 2013, uh, according to the state of uh, state resolution, we created such rules and regulations for direct import of medications and also indirect through intermediaries. We also created favorable conditions for the development of SMEs uh, and uh, the medication import situation in our country uh, and its analysis shows that import of some of the medications that are imported directly uh, from the manufacturers are priced uh, in a higher way than from intermediaries. However, according to the studies of our Commission, the basis of the complaints uh, issued by the economic entities that claim that this system has some drawbacks and needs some legal revamp. Uh, so there are re reviews to import medications uh, uh, by the authorized entity and we have this uh, overseeing body for medication uh, based on the packaging and safety rules. Uh, so when Voltaren was imported, that was exactly the situation. This m uh, medical product was produced and registered uh, by the right holder, uh, by the Swiss company Novartis Pharma. It was produced and registered in Armenia. The economic entity that applied for our commission, to our commission, bought Voltaren in a third country, and they made an attempt to import it through a Hungarian intermediate. Uh, in Hungary, the product was repackaged. However, this required a new registration of the product, and uh, the Trombo name. Uh, so the, our overseeing body, the supervision inspection, rejected this uh, because of the change uh, in the series of the uh, product that was previously registered in the Republic. So this authorized um, health care authority is against parallel import of medical products on the basis of uh, entailing a lot of risks and uh, that the current legislation also provides limited uh, opportunities in order to them just to trace back the provenance in order to uh, provide for the consumer safety. Hence, uh, the issues related to the medicated products through intermediaries, imported through intermediaries, are still open. Who is to be responsible for the safety, quality, uh, and other things? Uh, here, because in this uh, scheme, the uh, medical product will be sold beyond the involvement of the product producers. So, uh, our commission uh, had uh, an in depth look into the parallel import procedures on the ground of these complaints. And uh, results of the study initiated by the Commission were submitted to the Armenian government, uh, with uh, containing also proposals for amendments and changes of the current legislation. And we're now discussing the um, uh, the draft law on medication and medical products that will set out a, a tougher regulations for parallel import schemes. After the law has been adopted, some a legal act supporting it will be also adopted that will regulate the parallel import uh, mechanism 
uh, in the field of packaging, in the safety, quality and efficiency areas uh, in accordance uh, with the requirements of the new legislation that will uh, help uh, avoid uh, conflicting and various interpretations of this law by the economic entities, companies and the authorized uh, institutions. Despite the indicated challenges and problems, implementation of the parallel import scheme in the Republic had an, a positive impact on the markets of medication, medical markets, markets of medical products. And the pending uh, legal and legislative changes will stimulate competition in this field. At the same time, we think that for the more effective regulation of parallel import, apart from legislative changes and legal regulation, we also need to provide for, for co cooperation with other customs union uh, members and the members of the single economic space. As international experience shows, parallel import system can prove more effective and implementable on the basis of the single and mutually acceptable legal regulation mechanisms and if a single economic space is provided for. Apart from medications and, and medicated products, our Commission also uh, uh, analyzes issues of uh, uh, allocation of other products uh, through the parallel import scheme it, because it can stimulate the competition and will limit the monopoly activities and prevent the possible market division and reduce the product prices. Uh, also, I would like to touch upon one uh, more important issue. According to our studies, the issues relating to economic competition uh, often uh, have to do with the activity of uh, different uh, state agencies and authorities uh, in their regulatory competence. Different countries have uh, dedicated uh, uh, competition authorities providing for the competition protection. Still, these uh, state-based authorities fail to effectively combat uh, competition violations. Moreover, our uh, anti-monopoly authorities and competition authorities uh, are take the, have to take the blame uh, for the existing uh, problems with economic competition. However, these authorities uh, can not uh, effectively address all the issues arising within their sphere of competence. So I'm sure that uh, furthering our competition in this field, we will create more effective approaches to solution to solving uh, the existing problems and challenges. Another important issue for discussion that I would like to suggest is faced by virtually every country. I'll, uh, so uh, authorities face various issues uh, dealing with the uh, outcomes r rather than the reasons for these processes, w which are the competi competence of other authorities. And uh, often it entails ignoring or misuse or uh, uh, misinterpretation of the legal provisions which are beyond the competence of competition authorities. Hence, in order to solve the in internal national problems, we need to create efficient mechanism and enhance cooperation between all the authorized state agencies and departments. Due to that, all of them will have uh, an opportunity acting together with regulators to look for uh, the uh, solution to the challenges that we face. I'm confident that the discussion at this forum, together with the representatives of uh, fair trade agencies and foreign colleagues, will uh, prove an efficient tool to design the uh, effective 
mechanisms for developing further cooperation between our countries. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you successful implementation of all our plans. Uh, are there any questions to Artak Kivorkevich? Mm, microphone. Uh, how would you estimate the development of competition in Armenia within the last three years? Improvement or vice versa, and then the joining the customs union. Uh, will it uh, produce serious improvement of the competitive situation, or do you expect the correct regulation and only that? I'd like to start with the second question asked to me. Naturally, joining the customs union and this uh, integrated economic space will mean uh, definitely the improvement of the competitive situation in Armenia. We'll have an enormous market because we have a limited market so far. And the increase of the market will Mm, uh, just facilitate the emergence of new economic entities and economic space uh, will uh, be a huge market for our economic entities and this will stimulate the increase the growth of uh, so those economic entities and uh, multitude of economic uh, entities will be interested in doing good business and uh, since the market is going to increase uh, it will definitely serve to improve the competitive situation in Armenia. Concerning your first question, within the last three or four years past, competition in Armenia has been increasing, or at least we are witnessing some significant changes in Armenian legislation. And uh, we have worked together with international experts uh, consulting them, we uh, just harmonized our uh, legislation with international standards to a large extent. Then we had a lot of cases, especially in uh, government procurement, and uh, we had a lot of administrative uh, cases in uh, consideration. All the efforts of our commission um, uh, resulted in the improvement of the competitive situation. Just to clarify, uh, as for the institutes of the competition protection, uh, have you exported any of them from Russia? Did you follow any role model or did you borrow any best practice? Like, for example, Russia is looking uh, at uh, the best practices from the US or EU well, yes, the definition of uh, monopolistic prices. This is a very important element in the legislation of uh, the Russian antitrust uh, agency. And uh, we have uh, invested a lot of effort into investigating this definition. And we are going to introduce a similar definition, the definition of the antitrust uh, prices or pro just monopolistic prices. I could give you more examples, but this one is a very good and eloquent one because we, it uh, proves that we uh, are borrowing some of the best uh, practices from Russia. Uh, just uh, Artak Georgievich has quoted a very good illustration saying that Mm, Armenian market used to be relatively small, but very soon it is going to merge with the Eurasian economic space. Mm, and this is the first step, uh, the trampoline for mm, just to start thinking about the alignment of legislation standards or harmonization between the legislation. Because uh, um, uh, and uh, then we should follow the example of the European Union, and uh, it deems to me that this unique opportunity um, that is provided by joining the uh, Euro Eurasian economic space should be really used. 
uh, we, are, we have a colleague from Belarus here, but you are the main driver of those changes. The, uh, so probably you should think more about the harmonization of legislation of the member countries. Was it a question or was it a statement? Ah, okay, a statement. Now I have a question. Armenia's economy is not the strongest, to put it mildly, in our union. And you're hopeful uh, for it to improve. Are you planning to have any um, legal base or any laws that would uh, contradict uh, antitrust laws or just any, uh, are you planning any protectionist measures, any preferences to be given to domestic uh, producers that could go against the principles of antitrust? Uh, because of course your compatriots uh, won't uh, support you if Russian global uh, companies uh, strangle your domestic producers. Well, all those issues are being discussed within the framework of the uh, customs union and uh, integrated economic space, but we already do have certain agreements and uh, we uh, were members of this agreement. There are some recommendations for the draft uh, law, and uh, but on our part we will try to approach uh, to follow all the uh, commonly shared principles of this agreement. And this agreement, um, like you say, we, well, of course, we are not planning any contradictions of the kind. Thank you for your questions, but we must move ahead. We have three more uh, speakers. Uh, we have online uh, recording of this session, and then later on you will be able to visit the website and uh, probably listen to the presentations again. Uh, information shared here is highly useful and interesting ideas. Now I would like to give the floor over to Jose Oliver, Deputy Commissioner of the Competition Commission from South Africa. Yeah, I want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers and uh, first uh, Russia and in particular Mr. Atimov for inviting South Africa to come and participate at this uh, conference. It is, it is indeed a pleasure to uh, be here. I must say, when I first arrived here, uh, I was really struck by this uh, very beautiful uh, city with all its uh, architecture and uh, its artwork and the canals. And what really, really uh, amazed me was the unique and unusual experience of the, the White Knights. I think that was really, really uh, something that, uh, that struck me immediately. Um, at first, I thought I was a bit disorientated from all the kind of jet lag until, you know, I asked someone, they told me, no, the sun really does set very late here, here in, 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 in St. Petersburg. But uh, let me move on um, uh, to the presentation. And I thought uh, before I actually get into, you know, what I wanted to kind of say, I think there were some very interesting questions that uh, came from, from the audience. I think the one was, you know, around um, associations, uh, in, in South Africa, we call them uh, trade associations. And uh, you know the value of, uh, what's on? Okay, let me get closer. <laughs> and uh, in particular, uh, we call them uh, trade associations. And uh, you know, they have a very useful uh, purpose to play, especially uh, in industries where you need uh, some form of uh, coordination. And when I talk coordination, I'm talking obviously coordination of uh, business, not anti-competitive uh, practices. But trade associations uh, have seemed to be a red flag for antitrust agencies and competition authorities. And in particular, our South in South Africa is that um, for us, that's a red flag to uh, look into, into those markets. And we found in particular with uh, cartel uh, enforcement that trade associations have been the platform for collusive uh, behavior, for facilitating uh, uh, collusive uh, behavior. So, the, ne the other question that was asked, and I thought there was a kind of link uh, between that question and the warnings to firms, uh, you know, when you suspect that a particular firm or group of firms are involved with some anti-competitive conduct, be it uh, cartel conduct or abuse of dominance, you know, uh, what would be the option of providing them or giving them a warning? And in South Africa, unfortunately, we can't provide warnings to firms. Because once a firm has engaged in anti-competitive conduct, the authority is obliged to investigate 
uh, that particular conduct and take action against uh, that conduct. So what we have developed through our advocacy program is that we provide, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, an advisory opinion. Uh, although the advisory opinion is not uh, binding on the, on the commission, but a lot of firms have now uh, opted to take advice uh, from the uh, commission. So if they want to delve into a particular conduct in a, in a market with their fellow uh, competitors, they would first ask the, the, the commission where they have doubts about the conduct. They would first um, approach the commission and say, provide us with, a, with an advisory opinion on this particular conduct that we want to embark on, and what's your advice on, on, on this? Uh, and what the commission does is we provide quite a comprehensive uh, piece of advice on, uh, on, on this conduct. And, and you'd find that nine times out of ten, the firms would take that advice and they would not pursue uh, that particular conduct if we, we deem it to be uh, anti-competitive. So that was, the, I think, uh, the two kind of key questions that I, I picked up uh, from the audience. And, and yesterday, uh, when I came through and I... Um, attended some of the sessions. Uh, the one session was, was very, very interesting. Uh, it was around uh, the legal services uh, market, and uh, I must say there was a lot of enthusiasm for that particular uh, uh, session. And um, I think the key kind of question that came up from there was, uh, you know, uh, whether Russia should be an open or closed market when it comes to uh, legal services. And one would find uh, that there's so much a parallels between Russia and South Africa in this regard that um, after 1994, uh, when South Africa became a democratic state, <clears throat> one found that various uh, international uh, market players, especially in the legal space, started to relocate to, to South Africa because they believed it was a, a kind of space where there would be a lot of legal challenges, a lot of constitutional uh, challenges as well. We find that lots of uh, many large uh, international legal firms uh, found their way into South Africa. And a concern here in Russia, and very similar to, to South Africa, was that how would domestic players be able to compete uh, with these uh, multinational players that uh, do come with a lot of experience. Uh, in addition to that, they are quite large, reputable firms. And uh, it was very strange that, uh, fortunately in South Africa, is that you know, we opened up the markets and we gave the market a chance to, to unfold. And it didn't take many years before domestic lawyers and advocates started to compete uh, with some of the best uh, lawyers in the world. And surprisingly, today, many of the uh, international uh, uh, firms in South Africa are employing local domestic uh, lawyers. So that uh, particular market, domestic market, has uh, you know, grown uh, leaps and bounds in the, in the last uh, 20 years. OK, I think that was a bit of an introduction for me. So I want to get into exactly what I want to say today. And, and I thought, uh, before I get into the real nuts and bolts of uh, competition policy, industrial policy, and how one should uh, interpret it, and how one should cooperate based on, on those policy principles, is that I would give uh, the audience a background of uh, South Africa so you have a better sense of the context in which I am uh, speaking from. Now, South Africa, as I said, uh, became a democratic state in uh, 1994. And prior to that, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, what we call discriminatory laws as far as the economy was concerned, in the sense that uh, not all citizens in the country had an opp fair opportunity to participate in the, in, the, in the economy. To some extent, the economy was uh, uh, rather close to many of the citizens of the country. Although there were some multinationals operating in the country, that there was a period when there was international sanctions on South Africa. You find that many of the uh, multinational companies withdrew from the, uh, from the country. And the economy started to kind of retrogress, and it started to become very uh, uh, inefficient. And, and the, one of the reasons why it started to become inefficient is because there was a lot of state intervention uh, in the economy. There were a lot of uh, state-sponsored firms operating in the economy. And as a result, a lot of the state-sponsored uh, firms uh, could rely on, uh, on, on the state as a shareholder that uh, when, they, when they required a, a bailout, they would get that uh, kind of bailout. I think today uh, one calls those state-sponsored firms uh, sometimes state-owned entities. And one finds that state-owned entities, to some extent, 
are not as efficient as a firm that's participating freely uh, in the economy. So that was uh, partly the reason why uh, you know, the economy became uh, very, very uh, inefficient. So after 94, one of the first priorities of the new government was to try and transform the economy so that every South African uh, can benefit uh, uh, from the economy. And one of the things they did is they started to develop uh, industrial policy. And industrial policy that was, number one, custom made uh, for the country that would be able to, to take the economy and grow the economy from the past. And in the past, you know, there was high levels of unemployment, uh, the growth rate, uh, economic growth rate was uh, on average 3%. And the country was looking to target at least uh, 6%. And the country was looking to create more uh, job opportunities. So in addition to the various programs they had in the last 20 years, I think one of the most ambitious programs uh, they started to develop was in, in recent years. In 2010, uh, the country established what we call uh, the, um, the National Planning uh, Commission. And the National Planning Commission is responsible for a 20-year uh, plan. And this 20-year plan um, will create 11 million uh, jobs in the next uh, 20 years. And we believe that through job creation, we'd be able to ignite uh, the economy uh, going forward. And to do this, uh, the country started to target certain sectors uh, in the economy. And one of the sectors they prioritized and I think this is a parallel with Russia when I was listening to some of the sessions yesterday, is infrastructure uh, development uh, in the country. So the country has identified 18 uh, strategic projects uh, that would uh, be responsible for helping to uh, uh, reform uh, the economy. And these projects are very, very large uh, projects. It is uh, projects to build, for example, universities, projects to build dams, projects to build uh, national highways, um, uh, projects to build uh, hospitals. So it's major infrastructure projects, including projects in, uh, in energy uh, generation. So uh, these are the projects that uh, in the next 20 years that will help to transform the economy. Now, where exactly does competition policy, given what I said about industrial policy, and how the country uh, aims to uh, transform the economy. Where does competition policy come in? Now, I know there are a lot of uh, authors throughout the world and academics and, uh, and jurists and, um, and practitioners would have different views on the role of uh, industrial policy and uh, economic policy. And sometimes there is a useful tension between industrial policy and economic uh, uh, policy. Sometimes the industrialists would not always take into account the competition concerns in some of their policies. And vice versa as well, you'd find that uh, competition authorities would be very high-ended and would look at the literal interpretation of the law and the policies and would try and enforce those, those, those policies as well. But the kind of view we have in, in South Africa, uh, given especially that we are an emerging uh, economy, that we have different challenges from uh, uh, developing uh, developed uh, countries, that one of our biggest challenges is consumer welfare. And making sure that uh, consumers, uh, you know, in particular, uh, get a, uh, a fair kind of uh, uh, economy where there are fair choices around uh, uh, products and services and, and prices in particular. We kind of say that uh, there must be a strategic link between industrial policy and competition policy. So what the, what the country has done in 1998, it has uh, implemented the key legislation as far as uh, competition uh, is concerned in South Africa, the Competition Act of 1998, and the Act created various uh, institutions. And the one institution uh, was uh, the Competition Commission. That is, that is responsible for the enforcement uh, of the law. And it created uh, adjudicative bodies, uh, the competition uh, tribunal, which is equivalent to a, a high court, and it created the competition appeal court. And uh, appeals can also go to various other levels in South Africa as well. Uh, the legal system is still available for appeals. We have the Supreme Court of Appeal and we have the Apex Court, which is our constitutional court. So we find that uh, these matters can go and appeal to uh, a much higher level as, as well. Now, given the kind of court system I spoke about, and I want to come back to competition policy in, in particular, 
competition policy in, in, in South Africa is very much aligned to industrial policy. We realize that uh, for competition uh, policy to help to transform the economy, there must be that strategic link to industrial policy. So the, what the Commission has done over the, the last few years, uh, it has sort of looked at the priority areas uh, in the country from an industrial policy point of view, and we've kind of, in a sense, mirrored the kind of market sectors that we need to make an impact on. Because we believe we make an impact in these prioritized market sectors that we would help to transform the economy uh, fourfold uh, going forward. So we, we have targeted certain uh, kind of uh, markets. And I think it's no different from, from Russia and some other you know, uh, countries as well. Uh, number one is uh, for us is infrastructure. And construction is a sector that we have uh, targeted. Uh, food and agro-processing is another sector that we have targeted because we believe that with uh, food inflation in particular, it affects the poorest of the poor in any country. Uh, I'll come back a little later and I'll give you examples of some of the cases that we uh, have done as well. And then the third sector that we have targeted is what we call um, uh, in intermediate industrial uh, products. Now these are the inputs into, into construction. For example, uh, cement, uh, steel, chemicals, uh, polymers, uh, these are the inputs into construction. We believe that that was another key uh, market sector to, uh, to target as well. And the last fourth priority sector for us is um, what we call financial services. So kind of financial services is also the backbone to any economy, and we decided that that is one of the other sectors uh, that we would uh, target as well. Now, that does not mean that the Commission does not do any other cases. Uh, in addition to the priority sectors, we would, on a yearly basis, when we plan our enforcement uh, uh, kind of action, our advocacy action, we look at other emerging sectors as well. Like one of the other emerging sectors as well is, uh, is uh, private healthcare. In South Africa, uh, you know, uh, private healthcare is quite expensive. And uh, you would, uh, although we don't ha really, really have the problem with, with fake uh, uh, medication, but we do have a problem with very, very high uh, prices in uh, private healthcare. And, uh, you know, unless you take out uh, medical insurance, uh, you know, private healthcare in South Africa can be very, very expensive. So that's another market uh, that we have uh, targeted uh, go going forward uh, as, as well. Now, competition policy in practice uh, has lends itself to basically three areas. The one area that uh, you know, we focused uh, very, very uh, intensely in, in, the, in the beginning years of the formation of the Commission was merger control. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about merger control now. Uh, the second area was obviously enforcement of both uh, cartel conduct and enforcement of abuse of dominance. Those are the another area that uh, you know, we have targeted. And the third area, I spoke about it very briefly, was advocacy making sure that uh, we bring about awareness, making sure that uh, firms uh, comply with the legislation, making sure that firms uh, implement compliance program. So that's another big area that uh, we have uh, focused on. Now, I want to come back to, uh, to merger control. And in South Africa, you know, unlike, uh, you know, I know sometimes uh, one benchmark against some of the most developed countries, and, and I think the question I want to, you know, kind of uh, mentioned today is that one can't uh, import uh, policies, uh, you know, uh, in its direct format. One needs to customize it for your specific circumstances. So when it comes to merger control, what we have done is we've borrowed the best benchmarks from the world, but we've added something new to uh, merger control and what we call uh, public interest issues. Now, in addition to, you know, looking at a merger purely from a... Um, from an anti-competitive uh, point of view, which the legislation uh, compels us to do, but it also compels us to look at the public interest I issues. Now, I want to touch uh, more on the public interest issues and give some examples of how our courts have interpreted uh, the public interest uh, issues. And, and I think certainly it's, uh, you know, it's lessons that uh, you know, one can learn from uh, emerging economies. Uh, you know, how courts have interpreted, uh, you know, public interest issue. Now, there's four public interest issues. The one public interest issue is around employment. It's around uh, wh whether, uh, you know, firms that are, that are, um, that are, that are merging, 
whether there is going to be a uh, retrenchment and a loss of employment. So that's the one area that we look at. Obviously, if the, if the firm is uh, shedding jobs uh, purely due to uh, you know, uh, labor, due, purely due to uh, labor issues, the commission does not get involved in that. But if it's merger specific, then the commission gets involved, uh, involved in, 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 in that. Then the other uh, public interest issues uh, we, we look at is number one is the effect on a particular market. Whether it's going to affect the market uh, in, a, in a negative way, uh, you know, whether the market, uh, for example, uh, would uh, remove, for example, you know, competitors and prices will increase unilaterally. So those, those are the effects that we, we, we look for on, on the market as well. And then in South Africa in particular, one of the areas of economic development is promoting the interests of more small businesses. So we look at uh, the ability of uh, small businesses uh, to compete in the market, and if uh, you know, the merger is going to uh, put a sort of uh, squeeze on small businesses, we look at the interests of small businesses as well. And the last uh, kind of uh, area that we look at, as far as public interest is concerned, we look at the ability of national industries in South Africa to compete on an international basis as well. So we look at uh, the ability of uh, that as well. Now, in the last five years in South Africa, um, uh, you know, the area where we've been very, very strong on was uh, in uh, putting conditions on mergers as far as employment was concerned. I think in the last five years alone, uh, the Commission has saved about 5,000 uh, jobs in the, in the last uh, five years, which is quite significant given the kind of market uh, conditions in South Africa. Unemployment is still quite at a high level. Um, at uh, some years, the average above uh, 25%. So I think that was quite a major uh, achievement for, for the Commission. Now, I want to give two examples of where uh, you know, the, the competition tribunal had come up with very innovative and creative uh, uh, conditions as far as public interest was concerned. And the one was uh, in, um, in, in the famous uh, US brand, uh, my colleague here would, would know it very well, uh, Walmart was acquiring a controlling stake in one of the uh, retail firms in South Africa called Massmart. Uh, I think it was 51%. And, um, and uh, it was quite a lengthy kind of uh, trial at, at, at the tribunal. Uh, lasted for many, many years. And uh, one of the conditions uh, the tribunal uh, placed, in addition to employment conditions, where there were retrenchments of about uh, over 500 people, the condition was that they, 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 uh, uh, they would put a moratorium on, uh, on, on, on retrenchment. The other condition was around, uh, was around uh, developing, uh, the big concern the tribunal had was whether uh, Walmart was going to use overseas uh, suppliers and kind of uh, um, damage the local uh, uh, sup uh, supply chain in, in South Africa, which is quite, uh, quite uh, well developed in, in South Africa, that Walmart would start to import uh, many of the, the, the goods. Uh, so, the condi so the tribunal was concerned about that, and the tribunal said that uh, in addition to uh, approving the, 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 the merger, we're going to place a condition. And the condition will be very simple. You will create a fund of 240 million which is in, in, in South African uh, currency terms uh, quite a large amount of money. And you're going to use this fund to develop the local supplier uh, uh, chain in South Africa, uh, which uh, we thought was quite an innovative uh, uh, condition. Then there was another case uh, as well, also a US uh, company called Agri Group. Uh, this was more in the, the agro processing uh, uh, value chain. They were acquiring a, a firm in South Africa called Agri, uh, which was involved with uh, uh, grain uh, um, uh, silos uh, storage. And, um, and in this case as well, although in terms of the Competition Act, we could not uh, you know, identify any public interest issues that uh, we could uh, you know, uh, put a condition on in terms of the Act, but what the Commission did is, the Commission uh, uh, consulted with various of the stakeholders, including the merging parties, and we suggested to them that uh, they enter into a private agreement with the government departments in South Africa and other stakeholders, including uh, uh, farmer unions, uh, to develop the local uh, supply chain uh, in, in, in South Africa. And in this case as well, uh, the parties entered into a private agreement where they made available 90 million rand 
to develop the local uh, uh, grain and milling supply chain in, uh, in South Africa. I'm not too sure how I'm doing with time. Am I okay with time? Oh, still okay, okay. Um, so that was, uh, as far as mergers were concerned, then I want to give uh, a few examples uh, on the enforcement side. Um, uh, in enforcement side, uh, you know, we, we have targeted those priority areas. Um, the one area that we have targeted uh, was um, what we call um, uh, the bread cartel. Uh, the bread cartel where uh, the major manufacturers of bread and throughout the world, I mean, I think it's no different from South Africa, you'd find that rice and bread are the staple diet of uh, the majority of the population. So that's an area where they had a major impact on, uh, on uh, consumer welfare. So we targeted that area and we penalized a number of our firms and the fines that uh, we, we leave it out was, was quite high. But in particular for one firm that inflated the profit uh, margins over a quite long period of time, and uh, we recommended to the commission, uh, to the tribunal, that they, um, they asked the firm, number one, is to create a special uh, fund to develop uh, the downstream uh, retail market, number one. And number two is we asked the, the tribunal to also ask the firm as a remedy, as a behavioral remedy, to also reduce their margins for a period of time so that other competitors, uh, so, that the, so that the barriers to entry in the market uh, is lowered, other uh, um, competitors can enter the market, and also that uh, bread prices will also drop as well. Uh, uh, in, the, in that uh, particular region. And the tribunal you know, agreed with us and they implemented uh, those, con those, uh, those conditions. Then there were a non number of other cases uh, that uh, we have done as well. Um, there were a the few abuse cases uh, that we have done. In particular, uh, there was one abuse case where we penalized one of the largest uh, uh, telecoms um, uh, firm in South Africa which had almost 90% of market share in, in South Africa. Um, uh, although they were a fixed line operator, but they also provide uh, broadband services as well. And what they were doing is that in the downstream market, they were uh, squeezing the margins of uh, their fellow uh, competitors. Uh, prices were very excessive at the retail, uh, uh, retail level. And as a result, those retailers had no choice but to pass on those uh, inflated prices to the consumers as well. And um, we managed to, uh, um, to succeed against uh, that firm. And the penalty there as well was quite uh, creative as well. In addition to paying a uh, fine of uh, 200 million, uh, we also uh, uh, requested a condition that for the next five years that uh, they reduce their the pricing to uh, retailers over the next five years. And, uh, you know, uh, on an estimate, uh, you know, that will amount to a saving of about 875 uh, million to retailers. And retailers are obliged now to pass on that saving to uh, consumers. So from a competition policy point of view, you would notice by now that our focus is a lot on consumer welfare. You know, uh, many of our penalties and many of our conditions that we have placed has an effect on the consumers at the lowest level. We make sure that uh, whatever conditions we place, that there is a price uh, decrease or there is greater services uh, uh, to consumers. Then a little later this afternoon, I'm also participating in, uh, in, the, in, in the session on uh, cartel detection. So I don't want to say too much about the construction sector because I would give examples uh, of the construction sector in that session. But very briefly, I could say that one of the largest uh, cartels investigation in South Africa has been in the, in the construction uh, sector. Uh, it took the commission two years to investigate. Uh, we penalized 15 uh, firms that were part of the cartel. Uh, it was one of the largest fines, cartel fines in South Africa as well. Uh, the total fines were 1.46 uh, uh, billion. It was quite a complex cartel that was operating for over a decade in, in, in South Africa. And, uh, and I think uh, one looks at the impact now in terms of uh, especially infrastructure development in South Africa is that this market has been now, now become a very uh, transformed uh, market. Now, I did speak earlier on, and, uh, and I said that, uh, you know, the, health, the health, private healthcare in South Africa is, is quite a problematic uh, uh, market. It's quite a complex market as well. There's many layers to, to the value chain uh, in, in healthcare, you know, from your doctors and your specialists 
to your hospitals, to your administrators. So there's many uh, uh, layers in that value chain. And it can become very, very complicated that you'd find, for example, a patient would not deal directly uh, with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a doctor or a special, as far as payment is concerned because there's so many layers in between as well. And you'd find that when there are many layers in a value chain is that the end consumer end up paying far more uh, than uh, he or she uh, should pay for, for those services. Uh, largely because of the information symmetry between the service that you get and the actual advice that you get uh, from, a, from a doctor. So we decided to be innovative uh, in this sense is that uh, we pushed for the legislation to be changed and uh, in 2013 uh, we got formal powers to conduct uh, market inquiries and this is uh, one of the markets in which we are going to do a uh, market uh, inquiry. We anticipate that we would take about two years uh, to conclude this market inquiry, but uh, we've appointed an independent uh, uh, panel uh, headed by the former Chief Justice of our Constitutional Court who will be heading up that panel. they will be uh, part of, the, uh, of gathering the, the evidence and the information around, around the, the, the industry would be to have public hearings as well. So there will be a lot of public hearings and we anticipate that uh, once we've concluded this ma market inquiry that we will make a lot of recommendations, not just uh, around enforcement but around uh, policy changes as well. Um, just before I conclude, uh, you know, the one thing I want to say maybe um, around uh, uh, cooperation, especially, uh, you know, given uh, the, uh, the involvement of, uh, of the BRICS countries, is that, um, you know, cooperation, I think, I'll, there's many challenges to, to cooperation. I think a lot of those challenges are, are known as well. And I think uh, my kind of personal view is that to overcome these challenges, number one is, I think, uh, building relationships uh, between the various countries and building it at, a, at, a, at, a, at an agency level as well. Making sure people at agency level know one another, introduce themselves, visit the, you know, uh, uh, the countries as well. And also sharing experiences uh, at that level as well. I think for me that's kind of very, very important and critical. Now I know a lot has been said about you know the failure to uh, you know exchange uh, confidential information as well. But in South African law in particular, there is a very specific definition to confidential information. You know, it, it defines it as you know specific business information that has economic uh, value to the firm and is not known to the public. Now, in many of our cases, when we identify what exactly is confidential information, we find that it's a very small, small percentage of the information that has been provided to the agency. So one would say that it's a very small percentage of information that cannot be shared uh, openly uh, with, uh, with fellow agencies. But what the Act has done is it has created a mechanism in which even confidential information can be shared. Now, either the Commission or any third party can approach the competition tribunal and, and request access to that confidential information unless the respondent uh, firm can show that uh, you know, this information will, 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 will damage their firm economically. You know, that information, uh, the, the tribunal will most likely uh, you know, uh, request the firm, request access to, to that uh, information. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your report. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for your information. Uh, very substantive uh, presentation. A very uh, huge uh, record of experience, 12 years uh, of uh, criminal uh, investigations in uh, Southern Af African police authorities. Jose is also uh, a justice in the uh, Supreme Court uh, of uh, South Africa. Thank you so much again, sir. Uh, any questions? Masegina. Irina. I was very intrigued by your concept of uh, state interest uh, or, or public interest or whatever you called. Is there a definition in a uh, statutory text of uh, state or public interest, or does it exist only in court decisions? How is it conceptualized or interpreted uh, in various sectors? Or do we have a uniform definition? How do you go about it? Or any agency uh, has its own interpretation of public interest? Interesting question. Um, 
In South Africa, uh, you know, public interest, uh, you know, is uh, mentioned in uh, a number of uh, legislations, and as I mentioned, it's uh, mentioned in uh, in the in the Competition Act. It doesn't. There's no uh, specific definition uh, for it in in the Act. But what the Act does is it describes the various areas in which you can apply the the public interest. Um, we would find that uh, what the courts have done is in in on on a case to case basis, they would define what the public interest is in that uh, particular uh, case. So you would not find a definition of public interest uh, you know, in any legislation or in any uh, document. But uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, you'd find that uh, you'd find from one case to another case uh, that uh, the public interest definition would be broadened and would become more and more uh, clear. No more questions? So oh, there's one. I'm just uh, wondering about the relationship between industrial policy and competition policy. You know, sometimes the aims of these two policies may clash. And so the question is, to what extent you, in your practice you, you saw contradictions like this? And if, if you did, you know, how did you, you know, how did you deal with them? And maybe uh, the same question to um, to the fast Russia. Igor Yurich. Yes, Liam. Igor Yurich. Вопрос. Now, my question to you uh, is as follows. Is there a connection between uh, industrial policy and competition policy? Can, can, can there be a collision between these two policies or conflict of interest? Uh, kind of very interesting and very important question as well. I know I did paint the picture that uh, you know there is no uh, kind of tension, but you are right that uh, in practice, um, you know, as much as you align your competition policy to industrial ob ob objective, there are times when you'd find uh, even industrial policy as well would infringe on competition policy and, and enforcement in particular. What we have done in South Africa where we have uh, encountered uh, those uh, conflict is that we would work very closely with other regulators uh, that are responsible for, for example, your International Trade Administration Commission, for example, which will be uh, involved with uh, um, uh, tariffs and trade barriers. We would work very, very closely with them to make sure that uh, uh, whatever, uh, for example, trade barriers that they would consider that you would not affect uh, international players and will not affect uh, domestic uh, players as well. So we make sure that there is a balance between how uh, um, uh, industrial policy is um, uh, implemented and how competition policy is implemented. But I think the question you, 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 you kind of the answer you really want to know is what happens when there is a conflict. When there is a conflict, what we'd find that, uh, in particular from the perspective of the Commission, is that the Commission will enforce its, its rules. The Commission would, for example, find that that conduct, if it takes place, is anti-competitive. And we would look to either penalize that conduct or we look to, uh, for example, uh, request uh, that uh, you know, offending department to change uh, those uh, rules and to change uh, those behavior. So in a, in a sense, the, the Competition Commission has uh, concurrent jurisdiction with other regulators, but when there's a conflict, the Competition Commission rules uh, will, uh, will uh, uh, surpass the rules of other regulators. Well, organizers uh, have uh, told me that uh, we are being watched by a huge uh, number of people over the internet. We are being broadcast uh, beyond uh, uh, this room. Now, uh, to follow up on uh, the collisions or conflict between uh, to these two policies, um, they were always there. One of the solutions may lie in the dimension of uh, preferential treatment of national companies or national champions uh, to the detriment of an international actor. For example, uh, an instrument might be uh, a prohibitive um, import uh, duties uh, or something else. However, after we joined uh, the WTO, uh, we are limited in uh, such practices. Uh, we are in 
uh, the preferential uh, treatment of uh, national uh, companies. On the other hand, uh, I uh, do agree with my colleague from South Africa. We have to deal with uh, each case individually, oftentimes. Each collision, at one collision at a time. Because uh, individual situations are very, very complicated. Uh, uh, in identifying beneficiaries and they identifying uh, the chain of supplies. Uh, Sometimes it is very difficult to identify those things. Uh, one of the things that we've done uh, was to establish an open-ended site, a tendering site, uh, that uh, would register all stakeholders in a tendering procedure. This uh, tracking allows us to uh, follow up on uh, the on the bad trends in the market, like rising prices or li rising tariffs. Every single uh, time, on every single occasion, we try to intervene. I suggest that we move on. We still have two more presenters to go. Lianas Ioannis from the UCL Center for Law, Economics and Society. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, I know that uh, uh, I will not like to abuse the passions of uh, the audience and uh, spend too much time uh, with my presentation, obviously offering the possibility for questions. So I will limit uh, my comments uh, to uh, four issues that have been raised uh, pre by previous speakers. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, this idea uh, uh, that was put forward by uh, Professor Artemiev uh, to uh, uh, somehow uh, focus on uh, the practices or the best practices of other uh, jurisdictions. And I think this is definitely uh, a very sensible idea. Uh, we have been, uh, we have actually in comparative law a ongoing discussion about uh, legal transplants uh, and how these actually might be uh, effective uh, or not. Uh, a debate actually that starts uh, from uh, Montesquieu Esprit de Loi in uh, 1748, uh, the idea that uh, we have somehow to uh, uh, integrate uh, uh, legislation to the local customs and traditions. Uh, but at the same time, uh, other authors like Watson, uh, in particular, uh, advancing the view that uh, the legal transplants, or as actually political scientists that are more and more interested in these questions called uh, policy diffusion uh, processes, uh, are basically becoming uh, the somehow the dominant way of, uh, of, of uh, expansion of, of legislation, uh, in particular in a globalized uh, world. Uh, so I'm definitely extremely positive uh, to these type of ideas of looking a little bit to what's going on in other jurisdictions. Uh, that said, however, we have to be very careful in uh, some of the uh, possible local uh, situations uh, that should, uh, we should take into account. Uh, for example, uh, thinking about uh, the uh, market for uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, obviously uh, the market conditions that exist in various uh, uh, jurisdictions are actually very different. Uh, transport, transport costs might be extremely high uh, in a territory like that of the Russian Federation compared uh, to uh, transport costs, for example, in Luxembourg or uh, smaller, actually, EU uh, member states. Uh, it's also a market where you have a quite important state intervention uh, and in terms of uh, regulation of the prices uh, of pharmaceuticals. Uh, in Europe, actually, uh, a lot of uh, parallel trades uh, occurs because of the uh, different price regulations uh, between some jurisdictions uh, uh, like Greece uh, being one of them, uh, where uh, the prices of the pharmaceuticals are heavily regulated, uh, actually, and quite uh, low uh, compared to uh, uh, the ones practiced in the UK. And obviously, leads to a lot of uh, price arbitrage uh, and parallel uh, trade. Uh, so these are also issues that need to be uh, taken uh, into account, uh, as well as obviously uh, the view that uh, applying a uniform pricing 
uh, in pharma uh, might not always be the most efficient thing uh, in view of uh, you know the possible benefits of price discrimination in certain uh, circumstances. Uh, that said, however, uh, in the EU uh, we have been uh, very much trying the last uh, uh, 50 years to establish uh, an internal uh, market, uh, and we take extremely seriously uh, issues of uh, geographical uh, price discrimination uh, uh, or, you know, uh, prohibition uh, of parallel imports. Uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, European uh, Court of Justice uh, cases, the Kosten and Grudek case in 1966, it was actually about an absolute territorial protection, uh, which uh, was uh, prohibited. Uh, more recent cases of the European courts uh, in the GlaxoSmithKline uh, saga uh, concerning the application of articles 101 and 102, as well as prohibitions or bans on internet uh, uh, distribution uh, were considered by the European Court of Justice as being anti-competitive uh, because they led to a limitation of parallel imports. Of course, you know, uh, we might there pose a little bit and I realize that you might have two approaches. One, which could be, I will call, deontological approach, which is the fact that, well, we have to make sure that parallel imports always occur, uh, and we have to make sure that uh, there is a high level of trade between member states uh, through parallel imports, in which case, you know, you'll adopt a prohibition, you know, uh, uh, policy uh, for these type of measures. Another one, which was put forward by the General Court of the EU in the GlaxoSmithKline case, which was not confirmed actually by the position of the uh, Court of Justice uh, on appeal, uh, was to think to consider who actually benefits out of these parallel imports uh, are actually these price differences. Uh, if actually the the importers, basically the parallel importers, uh, uh, gain most of the uh, uh, of the profits, and these are not passed on to consumers. Uh, maybe you know we have to really think very closely about this type of practices, and in some cases, you know, uh, accept uh, prohibition of, of parallel imports uh, or uh, at least practices like dual pricing practices that might. Uh, limit uh, parallel uh, imports. And this is, I would say, uh, an uh, ongoing uh, debate. Uh, obviously, um, you know, this issue raises important aspects of interaction between trade and competition. Uh, uh, I know that in Russia it's very hot the principle of uh, exhaustion. We have this uh, in, in Europe uh, concerning community exhaustion. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, these are issues that should be taken into account. So economic circumstances, I would say, and uh, particular uh, sector-specific circumstances uh, like you know, important regulation by the state are things to take into account. Um, now, the second thing uh, we need to uh, take into account when we try to transplant, let's say, uh, foreign legal uh, practices is that uh, legal practices evolve. Uh, for example, thinking about uh, uh, even in the, uh, 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 the countries that actually are the export country, as I also would call it. Uh, uh, for example, thinking about uh, motor vehicle uh, regulation, uh, in Europe actually uh, we uh, have a specific uh, sector specific, let's say, uh, regulation for uh, vertical agreements uh, with regards to the uh, motor vehicle sector. Uh, uh, and um, uh, this regime actually has been uh, changed uh, by more recent regulation in 2010, which uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, limited the applicability of this sector specific rules for motor vehicles, uh, which do not apply anymore uh, to uh, the sales of new vehicles market. Uh, uh, and so it's very important uh, to uh, look, let's say, to the evolution uh, of, of the legal practice in these jurisdictions and maybe, you know, uh, in implementing uh, what is happening now in that jurisdiction may not be the right thing. We need somehow to look to the evolution of that regulation and the conditions that led to have a, a more astringent regulation uh, in 1995. Uh, if the conditions are similar to those in Russia, maybe, you know, you'll probably better uh, somehow take into account the, uh, uh, the previous regulation rather than the most recent EU regulation because obviously uh, we had uh, an ex some experience uh, and uh, they had the market conditions uh, have evolved. Uh, the same thing also uh, with regards to uh, developing, uh, let's say, uh, 
uh, uh, practices, best practices, let's say, that we will recommend uh, undertakings uh, to adopt. Uh, this is a, a policy that in Europe we had for a long time. Our block exemption regulations for the application of Article 101, Paragraph 3, uh, before, uh, let's say, the reforms of uh, the late 1990s, uh, were drafted in a way uh, where you had the black clauses, so these were the things that you should not have in your agreement, but also they had, we had the white clauses, the things that you should have in your agreement, uh, and in a way firms were basically copy-pasting somehow uh, the regulation in order, let's say, to, um, to adopt their practices. Um, the Commission uh, decided in the late 90s that that has led to some form of straight jacket effect. Uh, and uh, we needed somehow to enable uh, firms to be more innovative uh, and to, you know, somehow uh, risk uh, different types of practices. Therefore, we abandoned this idea of having wide clauses, uh, which, uh, you know, the fact that agreements should be notified, and we basically only have the new block exemption regulations, only have black clauses, so things that are hardcore restrictions that you should not have, but for the rest, basically everything is possible, uh, and the firms should self-assess uh, their practices looking to their market shares and to their uh, possible effect on the market. Uh, so that's also something that shows some evolution in the European practice. And the question is, you know, when you try to transplant uh, such practice, uh, you know, is it, you know, you have to look to your conditions and to what somehow made uh, the uh, Europeans basically evolve in this particular issue and take a different approach uh, in a matter of uh, 20 or, or 30 years. Now, uh, with regards to um, uh, uh, the idea of having uh, self-regulation, and I think this is obviously uh, a very important uh, topic, and that happens uh, quite uh, quite a lot. Uh, sometimes self-regulation is actually uh, preferable to uh, uh, to regulation, uh, incentive regulation, or uh, uh, or uh, regulation which is much more um, intrusive uh, to uh, to the firms. However, as the previous speakers uh, have um, uh, spelled out, uh, there are some risks uh, with having uh, firms, let's say, meeting together uh, and uh, discussing a number of, of topics. Uh, obviously, um, in the EU, we have, uh, uh, you know, it's quite common to have, let's say, voluntary environmental agreements where the uh, firms are somehow uh, deciding together or standardization agreements, etc. There is a very interesting uh, uh, block exemption regulation and guidelines concerning horizontal uh, cooperation agreements where these type of uh, agreements are uh, very much um, uh, uh, examined. However, I have to say that at the same time, uh, the European uh, Commission uh, and the courts most recently have a very active antitrust policy with regards to information exchange agreements. So we have actually uh, seen a number of uh, high-profile cases where information exchange uh, on sensible aspects like price, or output, etc., has been heavily fined. So somehow, you know, I will say if you are going to go towards that idea of having this type of uh, rules of conduct within firms of self-regulation and, and having discussions between firms, you need at the same time to be very careful and probably also show some teeth with some uh, uh, information exchange type of cases where you uh, make very clear to firms that uh, we have to be extremely careful uh, here. Uh, I mean, uh, that also relates a little bit to the discussion o o on public interest that we had uh, before. Uh, obviously, merger control, um, at not at the EU level, but for example, in the UK, you have the possibility of public interest uh, both being brought in uh, through the Secretary of State. That hasn't really been used. I mean, it has, I mean uh, my uh, understanding is that it was being used only in the Lloyd's HBO's merger. Uh, uh, but generally, actually, we, uh, we, we tend to uh, focus focus on the competition uh, assessment. Uh, in the context of uh, antitrust, uh, obviously, and, and Doug referred to the Walters case, uh, we have a couple of other also cases where uh, public interest concerns, in this particular case, this was actually uh, the idea that uh, you needed to uh, um, somehow enable the, uh, 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 the law association, the bar association in the Netherlands to regulate somehow the, the practice of the lawyers and to ensure uh, the integrity of the profession, whatever that means, uh, uh, that somehow uh, led to uh, uh, accept, let's say, a, an agreement that could have been uh, considered anti-competitive uh, otherwise, 
And, uh, and this is something that was done in the context of uh, paragraph one of Article 101. Uh, don't forget that in Europe we also have paragraph three of Article 101, uh, which also provides a possibility for justifications, although the Commission has been extremely careful to interpret Article 101, paragraph three, as not including non-competition concerns, let's say public interest uh, concerns. However, we see the integration of public interest concerns in the context of Article 101, paragraph one, in two ways. First, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, like cases like Walters, uh, or actually cases concerning uh, the International Streaming Federation. There was also a case concerning anti-doping anti rules uh, that could have actually been considered anti-competitive to a certain regard, but they were accepted because obviously uh, people will not like to uh, watch a game where every uh, athlete is, is doped. <laughs> that will not be fun. Uh, uh, and, uh, and obviously um, uh, there are other policy concerns here. Uh, where you do some form of intuitive balancing uh, analysis of the public interest objective from one side and obviously the restriction of competition on the other side. I would say these are very difficult cases because it's extremely difficult to, to do this type of cost-benefit analysis. Actually, it's not really a cost-benefit analysis because you don't monetize really uh, or quantify the uh, public interest benefit. I mean, you don't say like in cost-benefit analysis or impact assessments, or, you know, the protection of the environment is going to be basically, uh, you know, bring that amount of collective benefit amounting to 15 million, uh, you know, euros, and then the anti-competitive practice is going to cost like eight, not 15, it's higher than eight. We don't do that. Um, the only case where the commission did that uh, was in a case concerning uh, washing machines uh, and producers of washing machines that were decided to, um, uh, together, let's say, to stop producing uh, uh, energy wasteful uh, washing machines. So there's kind of some sort of standardization. Uh, and in the Sasset case uh, in 2001, and in this case, the Commission took into account the collective benefits that will come out of this public interest, let's say, uh, uh, protection of the environment and energy, uh, uh, let's say, uh, economies, and they quantified them. So they said this will be like seven times more than the, the competitive effect of that agreement. But that was the only case that the Commission uh, did that. Uh, so the question is also it's very expensive to do this type of thing. Um, in my other type of uh, interest, uh, apart from antitrust, is regulatory impact assessments, and I've looked at many, many regulatory impact assessments in Europe, I can tell you there are very few uh, that really quantify the benefits uh, of, uh, uh, of public interest benefits like environment, employment, etc., uh, and that proceed to a real cost benefit analysis most of the thing, most of the times this is more, this is qualitative. Uh, so uh, that's the first, let's say, uh, possibility to take into account public interest. The second one, uh, which hasn't been mentioned before, is uh, deciding the applicability of competition rules. Uh, in Europe, actually, we apply competition law to undertakings. So you have to actually uh, be an undertaking for a uh, competition law to apply. And undertaking is defined in EU competition law as an entity exercising an economic activity. So there has been a lot of case law concerning, you know, uh, things like social security or, uh, you know, uh, Euro control somehow it is a very famous case uh, to find out uh, all the healthcare you know and find out if this is an economic activity or not if it's not an economic activity if it's actually uh, um, uh, it's, it has a social purpose uh, and it's funded by the by taxation it's compulsory in, the, in this case the court found that that was not an economic activity and competition law did not apply in this context uh, so that's also another possibility uh, to take into account public interest concerns and and exclude, in this case, the application uh, of competition law. Coming finally uh, to uh, uh, my last two points, uh, the first one is uh, regards the uh, idea of, you know, what do you do with, uh, when you have an economic integration project or a trade uh, association project and you have competition rules, and I'll talk very briefly about the European 
uh, some high experience. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that that's a good experience to follow, uh, uh, but just to, um, uh, to shed a little bit some light on this experience. So what happened is that uh, when the Treaty of Rome was signed in 1957, basically you did not have a, a national competition of traditions apart from the Germans that basically they had adopted during the same time their uh, competition statute. Uh, so competition was pretty much uh, unknown. Uh, and in some member states, actually, it came in only in the late 80s. Uh, so they adopted competition legislation. Uh, however, you know, from the late 80s and the 90s, we've seen the development of national competition practice, and I will say quite, quite extensive one. Uh, and uh, the first thing that happened uh, was that we have seen what some authors have called the Europeanization of national competition laws. So basically what happened is that uh, competition laws that are developed by the member states basically were trying to emulate uh, the way actually the European uh, uh, you know, competition, the EU uh, competition law uh, was, uh, was drafted. Uh, and in some member states, like for example the UK, uh, we have a, a explicit clause like uh, that included in section 60 of the Competition Act of 1998, which basically uh, prescribed to uh, uh, the uh, national competition authorities in the UK and the courts when they apply UK competition law to take due regard of the equivalent solution uh, in EU competition law. So somehow, you know, they are compelled basically to take into account uh, what's going on in EU competition law. Now, at the same time, I will say a little bit uh, later in 2003, with Regulation 1-2003, uh, we have seen uh, uh, the uh, somehow even more limitations to uh, national uh, competition laws, let's say, experiences. Uh, the uh, Article 3 of Regulation 1-2003 includes basically a rule which prohibits uh, uh, a national competition law to be stricter than EU competition law with regards to, uh, to competitive uh, agreements. Uh, uh, EU, uh, national competition law can be stricter than EU competition law with regards to unilateral practices. Uh, but you've seen already that um, uh, there is some limitation there. So, for example, you, we cannot have something like what happens uh, what happened in the US with the RPM. Uh, if actually the European Court of Justice decides that RPM is to be dealt under a you know, sort of rule of reason analysis and is not an object restriction, uh, Germany or France, uh, French courts cannot go and apply French or German competition law that will somehow consider that RPM is by object restrictive to competition. So it's very funny actually that the EU, which is not a federal state, provides less uh, 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 ability to uh, uh, the, its constituent units, the states, uh, to have different competition status than the US, which is actually a federal uh, state. And at the same time, uh, we have seen uh, the development, basically, of uh, uh, rules uh, which provide that uh, decisions of the European Commission uh, about infringements uh, are actually uh, uh, binding uh, to national competition authorities and national courts uh, when they apply EU competition law. The most recent development is that coming out of the uh, uh, proposed damages directive, which is going to be implemented in the next uh, few months uh, in Europe, uh, which creates uh, for the first time a sort of I mean, there have been a lot of uh, questions about that, and uh, the first draft of the directive was providing for a binding effect of national competition authorities' decisions to other, let's say, national competition authorities or national courts uh, when they applied competition. So, for example, if you had the decision by the Polish competition authority that was finding that uh, a particular agreement was anti-competitive, you could use that decision and go to the British court and I say, well, look, you know, I want damages. Uh, I have this decision of the Polish National Competition Authority. That proves that there is infringement, so we don't really have to talk about infringement now. You just talk about damages. Uh, that was not accepted at the final draft of the damages directive. However, uh, National Competition uh, Authority's decisions can be considered as prima facie evidence of an infringement in uh, national, in other cases, in other, let's say, uh, in courts in, in, in non uh, uh, of course, which are not those of the National Competition uh, Authority. Uh, and that brings me to uh, my last uh, point, which is uh, this question that was asked previously about quick look and uh, rule of reason and per se. Uh, I think there we have to be also extremely careful uh, when we look to the evolution 
also and kind of comes back a little bit to what I mentioned as my first comment concerning transplants. You know, I have to have to be very careful to see what type of thing you are implementing, what time you know the evolution of the uh, uh, of the exporting legal regime you are actually focusing. Uh, in Europe, actually, we had a very for a long time, I think we had a very clear distinction between what we consider is a restriction of competition by object and restriction of competition by effect. Uh, I mean, these are uh, uh, two different, let's say, um, uh, uh, possibilities offered in the context of Article 101, Paragraph 1. Uh, generally, competition, uh, a restriction of competition by object uh, uh, for these type of restrictions, the court basically was limiting itself to looking to the uh, text of the agreement, the purpose of the agreement, and the economic and legal context of the agreement, but that was extremely narrowly defined. Uh, so in this particular, uh, for the cases that could be characterized as restrictions of competition by object, the court was not really defining relevant market, was not looking to market structure, was basically only focusing on the text of the agreement, the purpose, and the economic and legal context, a more general economic and legal context, but, you know, somehow narrowly defined. Uh, and that distinction was basically made because for certain types of practices, like cartels, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, output restrictions, etc., uh, RPM in Europe, uh, uh, we've, you know, considered that we have already a lot of experience uh, uh, with these practices, we know that they are already anti-competitive, so we don't have basically to spend time and effort in looking, digging more carefully. Uh, or, you know, we have a more, let's say, deontological reason uh, of market integration objective that we consider that this type of practice should never be accepted. I mean, and this is the kind of extra prohibition. Uh, for all other practices, we're applying uh, the effects analysis, so we're actually looking to uh, potential effects uh, on the market. Uh, and yeah, this distinction is well established in EU uh, case law, and some authors have actually created the so-called object boxes for vertical and horizontal agreements. They were saying, well, you know, these are the agreements that generally are within the object box, cartels, you know, RPM, uh, uh, prohibition of exports, etc. Now, what is interesting is that the very recent case of the European Court of Justice, the uh, Alliance Hungaria case uh, of the summer, somehow blurs this distinction. And the court in this time actually mentioned that uh, uh, even if you have an object restriction, you need basically to look to the structure of the market, uh, which brings the idea that you have somehow to know what is the market share of the parties. That is actually a major somehow evolution in EU uh, competition law. Uh, some people have criticized that by saying this is completely understandable, the, the court could not really uh, say, have said something like that. But I will say that it's very important to think about these differentiated rules, you know, somehow in per se or rule of reason or quick uh, look or uh, uh, structural reason approaches as basically trying to uh, uh, limit error costs and limit also procedural costs, the cost of making decisions. Uh, and, and technology evolves. Uh, and for example, uh, you can write now for certain industries, it's very easy to find out what is the market structure. You don't really need to go uh, and dig in uh, uh, extremely carefully uh, uh, if this is something which is extremely available. There are market studies, there are sector inquiries. So you can look to that. So from my perspective, you know, uh, the, uh, bringing in st market structure uh, when this doesn't really increase decision costs uh, uh, and decision procedural costs uh, might be something very positive. So when you are to transplant, let's say, uh, a, a legal regime of foreign experiences, you need to be extremely careful to understand very well the, uh, the evolution of the uh, legal transplant in the export country and see at which moment of the evolution of the legal regime of this country uh, uh, you actually need to transplant in. Uh, and that uh, somehow depends on your institutional capabilities uh, and the experience that uh, your courts or uh, competition authorities have. Uh, uh, European competition authorities 30 years ago had much less experience to deal with uh, uh, certain issues, uh, in particular effects analysis that they have now. So obviously, you know, when you are in a, uh, the level of institutional development, which is actually at the starting point, you need somehow to take into account that implementing exact the way actually the uh, EU practices now is probably not necessarily the good thing to do. Uh, you have somehow to think a little bit historically uh, of uh, what as um, maybe you know you could probably do what it was earlier uh, the case in Europe uh, as the first let's say stage of your institutional development. Thank you.
Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I wanted to remind you that uh, we have time only till two. And uh, uh, if there are no questions to Yanis, I will immediately give the floor over to Alexei. And I do apologize for limiting you in time. And uh, as just the director of the Department of Legal Policy and the Skolkova Development Fund. Yes, uh, of course, being the last speaker on the agenda is uh, challenging. What's happening with the sound? So, but I will try to be very brief indeed. And uh, I will try to speak about the integration program from the point of view of antitrust. Uh, Igor, in his presentation, showed a slide with uh, uh, stacking dolls. And uh, thus he illustrated the process of this world integration. But we are very weak in that. And even though there are networks of uh, all kinds of agencies, and even though there are some decisions and verdicts about the exchange of information, especially in the sphere of antitrust integration, uh, little, if any, success has been achieved. And uh, we have something to compare it with. And the level of the trade, where we analyze the trade turnover and where we protect uh, consumers' welfare and uh, all that, we have achieved a very high level of integration. I'm talking about the World Trade Organization, that due to the uh, liquidation of tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade, uh, has arrived at the unification uh, on the global uh, goods turnover and services turnover. And this organization, as one of its elements, even has the agreement on intellectual property protection that also sets strict unified standards and integrates the governments, the member governments and the member states into this uh, integrated uh, space. Uh, as for competition and protection of competition, we have nothing of this kind. And that's why the level of the world, the world level of integration in comparison with other sectors of uh, regulation, well, we can say that it's non-existent here, especially taking into, the, into consideration how uh, the, uh, the just uh, laws are executed. Uh, Yanis, in his uh, presentation, mentioned uh, the necessity of applying economic in-depth analysis and other approaches exercised by the European Commission. Previously, one of the colleagues, by the way, it was not uh, state interest. When they said public interest, there was wrong translation in one of the previous fragments. So when we speak, say, the public uh, interests are not uh, state interest. It's the interests of the uh, public. Then uh, the um, consumer welfare fair was also not translated great. But anyhow, all those antitrust decisions and all those um, attempts of uh, introducing all kinds of bans, they are uh, intranational. But the global market forces us to view the structure uh, in a different light. Let me give you some simple examples. When an antitrust agency, like for example, in the U.S., tries to estimate the um, impact of that onto the consumer welfare or the interests of consumers, and they are the uh, utmost uh, values that are being protected, it's the E e interests of the economic category of consumers. So they uh, just delimit that uh, only with uh, consumers of the U.S. So they see, uh, uh, they kind of put an equation mark between uh, the uh, economic and citizenship. So those who live in Canada, they consumers uh, living in can Canada, they are part of the same economic space, but uh, they're not included. Tra goods travel freely between Mexico and uh, the U.S., but the interests of Mexican consumers in the equation that is being formulated by the U.S. antitrust agencies uh, when passing their decisions. Uh, so they're not taken into consideration, those Mexican consumers, and they may have their own interests and so on. A similar situation is uh, concerns the turnover intellectual property that has a global uh, character. But in the same legislation on the level of uh, WTO that 
kind of sets the parameters, any elements of the uh, common agreements about the infringement of rights uh, concerning intellectual property are not uh, existent. Uh, and it was done consciously, because organically, had this VT, the WTO legislation been planned organically as it had been planned, and those elements for the protection uh, of fair trade would have been present there. And I want to remind you that the very first agreement about the um, establishment of the first system of the fair trade or liberalization of trade was in 1947 when the UN organization was set, the Havana Agreement, so as we know it. And the Havana Agreement envisaged a number of items about the protection of competition, including that on the market of the intellectual property, where they had several items listed specifically, and that was supported by all the participating states, including the USSR, that did not want this liberal integrated system, but then others block them, because at that at approximately at that uh, period of time, there was this nuclear bomb and other things in the USSR, and I'm sure you know this political story. Then everything came back to GATT, a uh, very narrow agreement only on tariff issues, and uh, when uh, during the Uruguay round and the beginning of the Nantes, they decided to transform GATT into a broader agreement, and they had this agreement on intellectual property. There wasn't a suggestion to uh, uh, adopt something analogous to TRIPS uh, about or the agreement uh, to protect competition, but it was failed again consciously with the purpose of not setting any uh, limitations for the markets, or for the goods rather, that served the interests of transnational corporations uh, that had free hand uh, in that situation. So we're talking now about the improvement of the methodology, and I understand that I've uh, used all my time, but only one last remark to make. Taking into consideration the global globalism of uh, trade and goods and services, especially in the, the segments that we deal with in Skolkova, and when thinking about the new methodologies and new approaches for position protection, we often forget that the real uh, tool set of departments is highly limited and uh, non-balanced with all the uh, opportunities and uh, tools that the international capital has. Let's use this word, it's a normal word, capital, producers of goods. And we remember that antitrust is a phenomenon in the U.S. Um, if, uh, emerged as a response to the concentration of capital and market power. Power. Now we see that we are uh, witnessing market power concentration on the global level, but the mechanism, mechanisms of regulation slowed down at this level, and still now they still exist only on the national level. No agreements on cooperation or data exchange uh, or investigation would be able to uh, kind of shift the situation, because we, what we need is norms and uh, legislations. They stimulate uh, export cartels, for example. According to uh, quite a number of legislation systems, uh, they well they are rather liberal about them, uh, just because of the established practices. And there is uh, quite a long list of issues like this. I don't want to abuse your time, so I will bring my presentation to closure. And uh, if I may, then uh, I will uh, just contribute when answering the questions of the participants. Thank you very much, Alexei. Separate thanks from the moderator, because you really passed a very important test. We are finishing on time almost. But uh, if, uh, well, we have one very brief remark from Judge Ginsburg, and before giving the floor over to him, you have a chance to, to ask your quick questions to Alexei. If there are no questions, then I'm giving the floor over to Judge Ginsburg. Thank you. In view of the late uh, hour, I will be very brief. Um, but I'm reminded of these remarks. They're prompted by a variety of things that have been said over the course of the last several hours. Um, every jurisdiction, including a new jurisdiction if the Eurasian uh, economic uh, zone emerges, uh, has to make decisions about whether it is whether its competition policy is focused exclusively on consumer welfare 
or takes other considerations into account under public interest or national interest or other specific interests that might be listed. It also has to make decision uh, both at the outset and periodically or maybe cons constantly about whether it is trying to maximize consumer welfare in the short run or in the long run. And governments by their nature are always under pressure to prefer other interests than consumer interests in the short run over the long run. Consumer interests are not well organized and well represented. Producer interests and other interests are, whether it's labor or manufacturing or what have you. The long run requires uh, explaining difficult decisions in which people don't get relief in the short run. People who are decision makers who have to run for office or who are in agencies that have to respond to politicians who run for office um, have a very difficult time defending decisions that have a long run payoff uh, but are difficult in the short run. And um, it, it seems to me that the uh, uh, that as soon as one gets, gets away from focus solely on consumer welfare in a competition agency, that the analysis is going to become polluted and, and difficult to keep it strict and, and uh, straightforward and honest. Other considerations will come in sub rosa, as it were. I think what South Africa has done by being specific about saying what they're taking into account at least prevents that difficulty. But every time you take a non-consumer interest into account, you are hurting consumers. You create 700 jobs in the mass mart case, or not create preserve for uh, 700 jobs. Well, everyone's a consumer. Maybe 60, 70 percent of everyone are employees or workers. So if you prefer employees, it's at the expense of, work, of, of consumers. Some of the costs are increased, efficiency is less, prices are higher, consumers are worse off. An economist from the U.S. was being shown the uh, big Three Gorges Dam project in China when it was being built. And he saw that the workers were using shovels instead of mechanized equipment. And he asked why. And he was told, well, it's to create jobs. He said, well, then why don't you give them spoons? Thank you very much. Actually, uh, you said what I was planning to say in the closure of this session, but uh, just one idea I just uh, that I wanted to voice. In the very beginning, Igor s suggested uh, to set up a work group on pharmaceuticals. And since uh, the red thread through all the presentation was the pharmaceutical market, pharmaceutics, and it is really a great concern of all the legislator, I mean the competition on this market. So probably we should uh, involve not only the BRICS countries, but also other participants of the discussion and uh, producers of pharmaceutics uh, that were mentioned in the very beginning. And if we succeed in that, then that will mean that we have met our goal, that it was not in vain that we assembled, that we found some important ground for further cooperation and for integrating our efforts. Thanks a lot to all the participants and the very last final remark. I just wanted to say that for two years we have had a work group uh, active that initially we set up with the Italian uh, competition agency also focusing on pharmacia and uh, the last session we had 12 participating countries. So we'll try to broaden up this topic and uh, we will continue working along this line within the BRICS framework and within the uh, Customs Union uh, Eurasian Economic Space. To, and uh, so now there are a lot of, we have a database for best practices, worst practices, and we also have a special platform for uh, kind of registering or putting down the prices that are exercised in those countries. So we invite you for cooperation. And one more thing. In the Russian government, we started uh, preparing uh, for 
the project, the project that can be of interest to our comrades from the customs union, the text of the international convention on the uh, struggle against international cartels. This is what Alexei briefly mentioned. I think that this is a very serious endeavor, long term. Uh, of course, uh, this was not part of our topic or investigation today, but we simply must come back to it. And the very last thing is, dear friends, thank you very much for this uh, conversation. For myself, uh, uh, just uh, I uh, heard a lot of interesting ideas, and uh, I'm looking forward to implementing them. And uh, it's interesting that uh, quite a few speakers organized the evolution of jurisdictions in several countries. And they say, well, if you take this road, just uh, um, uh, beware that there is such and such risk here. And that so yes, we can learn by just making the mistakes made by others. But here we heard some interesting uh, prevention. So thank you cordially for coming to St. Petersburg. And I hope that you will notice the white nights. There are not so many places in the world where you can see this beautiful natural phenomenon tomorrow night. Uh, we'll have a big celebration, school graduation parties, and uh, the rivers and canals will be full of uh, boats with red sails. You will see thousands of young people and concerts in the streets. And I don't think that you could have ever seen anything similar as a natural phenomenon in Canada, in Alaska, in uh, Norway, in Sweden. You can have see something similar, but actually, uh, just uh, this period is very beautiful and unique. Unique time. Enjoy it. Once again, thank you very much for your wise presentation.